I ran across this story. I thought it was hilarious. This Sunday school teacher tells this story. She teaches five and six-year-olds in Sunday school. And one Sunday morning, on Easter Sunday morning, she, she got up in front of the class and she said, guys, uh, tell me who knows what happened on Easter and why it's so important for us. And one little girl spoke up and she said, I know, I know, I know. Easter is when the whole family gets together and you eat turkey and there's a parade on TV and they talk about the pill. She goes, no, no, honey, that's, that's Thanksgiving. Teaches anybody else? The little kid stands up and he raises, says, I know, I know, I know. And so she calls on him and he says, Easter's when we get a Christmas tree and we decorate it and we give presents and Santa Claus comes and everybody sings Christmas. No, no, that's, that's Christmas. Finally, a third little student raises his hand and she's getting really discouraged by this time. And she calls on him. And he said, I know. Easter is when Jesus was killed and, and they put him in the tomb, and they left him there for three days. And she is thinking, oh, wow, he actually knows what this is all about. And then he goes on. He says, and then everybody gathers around the tomb, and he comes out, and they wait to see if he sees his shadow. And if he goes back in and he sees his shadow, we got six more weeks of winter. <laughs> well, you know, truth be told, truth be told, I guess Christmas is probably the most popular holiday because I think we like to eat. Oh, I love to eat. Praise God for turkey and ham. Bacon. Bacon. Oh. You know, there was, you know, God kept the, the, the Jews from eating pork for a long time. You know why, right? So he knew how good bacon was. But I think about collards at Christmas. Oh, and cakes and pies. But we, we get so wrapped around Christmas. But truth be told, guys, if it wasn't for Easter, there'd be no reason to celebrate the birth of Jesus. There'd be no reason to have any of the things that we that we do. You see, the resurrection is the supernatural power. The resurrection is that supernatural power that you and I need. It's that supernatural power that that transforms people's lives. I mean, it, it changes circumstances. It restores marriages. It restores relationships. It, 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 it ensures our eternity. And that's what the Resurrection Sunday, that's what Resurrection Power is all about. Everything, and I mean everything, about Christianity focuses on the Resurrection. Everything does. And, you know, I was looking this week and, and realized that all but four of the world's religions are based on philosophical propositions. And of the four that aren't, they're based on a, a person, a biographical person. But Christianity is the only one of those religions that claims an empty tomb for its founder. I went back through and, 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 and realized some dates and times and things. Judaism, its founder, is Abraham. And Abraham died in 1900 B.C. Buddhism was founded in 483, but it died when Buddha died. Go and talk about Islam. Muhammad died June 6th. 633 A.D., but Christianity, yes, Jesus died in 33 A.D., but he didn't stay dead. And it's proven because over 500 people says they saw him after the empty tomb. So we got Abraham, and he's dead. We got Buddha, and he's dead. We got Muhammad, and he's dead, but we got Jesus, and he's alive. Isn't that amazing? True story I want to share with you. I, I found this uh, on February 27, 2015. A lady by the name of Ruth Dillo had some people knock on her door. And when she came to the door, there were folks from the Pentagon there with a very sad message. They told her that her son, Clayton Carpenter, who was a private first class in the Army, had stepped on a UAD in Kuwait and was killed. Ruth later wrote, I can't begin to describe my grief. I can't begin to describe my shock. It was almost more than I could bear. 
For three solid days, I wept. For three solid days, I threw things and was angry. For three solid days, I was at total loss. For three solid days, people tried to comfort me to no avail because this loss was too great. Clayton was my only son. But after three days from receiving the news, the telephone rang. The voice on the other end said, hi, mom, it's me, Clayton. She went, what? I, I didn't believe it at first. I thought somebody was playing a horrible, cruel joke on me. But the more he talked, the more I realized that was my son's voice. He really was alive. The first message was a complete mistake. She said, I laughed. I cried. I threw more stuff. I felt like turning cartwheels because my son, whom I knew was dead, was now alive. I'm sure none of you can ever begin to understand the roller coaster of emotions I went through. I got to believe, I got to believe, though, that she experienced the same emotions that the people who were closest to Jesus experienced. See, there were people there who loved him, who watched in horror as he was hung on the cross. There were people there who loved him and watched him suffer in pain for hours on that cross. There were people there who loved him and heard him cry out, it is finished. There were people there who loved him, who actually got him off of the cross after he died. There were people there who loved him, who took him to the tomb and laid him there. And then in three days to realize who they loved and thought was dead was now alive. I want to this morning, I want to go back to that very first Easter Resurrection Sunday morning. But before we do that, how many of you brought your Bibles? We believe in bringing Bibles to church around here. If you brought your Bibles, hold them up. Old school's got pages and, and, and covers. New school's got screens. If you're visiting, listen to me. If you hold up your smartphone, I'll think you're holding up your Bible, okay? I'm one of the very few pastors that would say, I want you to play with your phone during church. We use an app around here called the Version app. If you don't know about it, ask the person next to you. They'll be glad to show you where it is on the App Store. You can download it for free. If you have it, you open it up, go to events, scroll down. There'll be a map that pops up. Click, uh, Thrive Church is on that map. Click on Thrive Church. Hit save. And all my notes for this morning's sermon will be right there on your device. I think that is so cool. Technology has come so far. But anyway, so let's go back to that morning. Let's go back before the sun even rose. It's still dark. There's probably a little bit of dampness in the air. Early, early morning, early, early hours of that Sunday morning, two ladies, Mary Magdalene and Jesus' mother, Mary, are preparing to go to the tomb. And that's got to be hard, especially on Mary, Jesus' mom. No mom should ever have to bury their children. And not only is she having to bury him, she's got to prepare him for burial. So they're running around and they're getting the things they need, the, the different things that are required in the, in the Jewish religion for a proper burial. And once they get that stuff together, off they go towards the tomb. It's still dark. I got to believe that as they're walking down the road, they're probably going through all the things that happened in that final week. Last week on Palm Sunday, we shared uh, communion together. We talked about the Passion Week, and we walked through every day of that week and the things that Jesus did. And, and the thing that, that I think is so striking is that on Sunday, when Jesus and his disciples went into the city of Jerusalem, it was as if they were welcoming the king or a, a chief of uh, or uh, a head of state or some some leader of some country because they treated him like a dignitary and they were shouting Hosanna and they were watching him and the folks who didn't know him were asking who is this guy what's going on but as we walked through that week last Sunday we realized that every day the tension got a little tighter every day the tension got harder by the time we get to Thursday you could cut it with a knife and I'm sure these ladies are thinking about all those things that happened from the time he went into the city 
to when he went to the temple and threw the money changers out, to when he was teaching in the temple, to when he was confronted multiple times by the, by the Pharisees and other church leaders, to possibly the Passover meal on Thursday evening, Jesus instituting and establishing the Lord's Supper, communion. And then him literally washing the feet of the one that betrayed him. As he washed all the disciples' feet. It went from thousands of people shouting Hosanna to thousands of people shouting crucify him. All in the span of five days. They had to be struggling. And then what they witnessed from Thursday night to Friday morning had to be even horrible. Mock trials, accusations, beatings, the processional of Jesus carrying his cross through the street. The soldiers mocking him and putting a crown of thorns on his head. Nailing his hands and his feet to that cross. Raising that cross up on the hill called Golgotha. The suffering. The death. And then the rush to get him off the cross and, and in a tomb before sundown, as was Jewish custom. And in all that rush, the folks, Nicodemus and Joseph, they didn't have time to bury him properly. So now his mom and one of his followers are going to do that horrible task. And that's where we pick up the story. Matthew 28, follow along with me. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It says, early on Sunday morning as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and rolled aside the stone and sat on it. His face shone like lightning and his clothes were as white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him and they fell down into a dead faint. Then the angel spoke to the women. Don't be afraid, he said. I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He has risen from the dead just as he said would happen. Come and see where his body was laying. Now, go quickly and tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead and he's going ahead of you to Galilee and you will see him there. Remember what I told you. The women ran quickly from the tomb. They were very frightened and also filled with great joy and they rushed to give the disciples the angel's message. And as they went... Jesus met them and greeted them, and they ran to him and grasped his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, don't be afraid. Go tell my brothers to leave for Galilee, and I will see you there. What an amazing piece of scripture. That's the crux of Christianity right there in that chapter of Matthew's gospel. The risen Messiah. So if you got your outlines, what I want you to do, I want to look at three things this morning. I'm not going to keep you to lunch, I promise. But I want to look at three things this morning that I think truly are uh, the examples of supernatural power. All three of these things surrender, surrender or center around what the women found when they got to the tomb on that resurrection Sunday morning. When they found that tomb empty. So if you got your outlines, let's go ahead and jump in. The first thing they found is that the empty tomb means Jesus is alive. It means he's alive. I've said it already. The empty tomb it literally is the very foundation of all of Christianity. In fact, I want you to look at what, what the Apostle Paul said in his first letter to the church at Corinth. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 17. Paul says, and if Christ has not been risen, then your faith is useless and you are as guilty of your sins. And that's the truth. If he did not rise again, there'd be no reason for us to be here. If he did not rise again, there would be no reason 
to have hope because there would be no hope. The gift of salvation. God's plan of reconciliation. This is it. I tell the folks around here all the time that before creation, before God ever spoke a word into being, he devised the plan of reconciliation. And that plan of reconciliation simply means this. Bridging the gap between a holy God and a sinful man. And that was done through Jesus. That was done through his shed blood on this cross on Calvary. And if it hadn't have happened, we'd still be separated because God cannot be around sin. And we talked about that we are redeemed by Jesus' blood. His blood is what covers us so that when God looks at us, he doesn't see our righteousness. He sees Jesus' righteousness. That's the gift of salvation. And the thing is, anyone who's ever said, God, I need you. God, I am lost without you. God, I am a sinner. Forgive me. Anyone that's ever said that can rest assured that you've been given the gift of salvation. And it is all totally based on the fact that this tomb is empty. That Jesus rose again. The moment Jesus rose. The moment that happened. The very second that he came out of the tomb. Everything changed. Everything changed for you and I. Hope came out of that tomb. Life came out of that tomb. And at the same time. It created a bunch of problems for people. In fact. It created a ton of problems for the people who tried to put him in that tomb to start with. They, they started scheming to cover their butts. And we see it in scripture. I mean, they knew they had a problem. They knew when the guards came back and said, he ain't there. They knew there was a problem. And they started plotting right then and there because they had a problem they couldn't fix. Matthew 28, starting with verse 11, says, as the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and told the leading priest what had happened. A meeting with the elders was called, and they decided to give the soldiers a large bribe. They told the soldiers, you must say, Jesus' disciples came during the night while we were sleeping, and they stole his body. And if the governor hears about this, we'll stand up for you so you won't get in trouble. So the guards accepted the bribe and said, that, and said what they were told to say. Their story spread widely among the Jews. And it still tells, still tell today. The soldiers were paid off. I don't think they handled that well. You know, I've always been told that unless you take everybody out that knows, somebody's going to slip. You know, but they paid them off and they went out and said this, you know. They were bribed for their silence. Now understand something. If Jesus hadn't actually risen from the dead they wouldn't have needed to be bribed because their story to the elders and their stories to the priest was hey the dude stole his body but that's not what they told them they told him this guy came back from the dead i don't know who he is but he came back from the dead i mean they actually told the truth they're actually witnesses to the resurrection of jesus and understand something, the, the attacks against the resurrection still come to this very day. But here's the deal. The burden of proof doesn't rest on my shoulders or your shoulders or any believer's shoulders for that matter. It rests on the shoulders of those who are bringing the accusations. They're the ones that have to explain the empty tomb. We don't. And, and over the years, there's been many theories that have been proposed why the tomb was empty, all of which are weak at, at, at very best. And all of them require that the disciples were a part of the cover up. And I have to be honest with you, before I came to Jesus, I can remember thinking, this is the biggest crock. That dude is dead and gone, and his bones are gone, but they've all lied through history. Well, that sounds easy. Why would they die for it? Yeah, that sounds easy, but it isn't. How many of you remember, or old enough to remember, or maybe not old enough to remember, maybe have heard about the Watergate scandal? 
Remember that? Okay, that was, that was the scandal that occurred when, when President Nixon was president, and that was like eons ago, back in the Stone Ages. But anyway, the guy that was chief counsel to President Nixon during the Watergate time, anybody remember what his name was? No, it wasn't Alderman. You're going to Google it? You don't have to. Chuck, Chuck Colson was his chief that okay he was they was his chief counsel now that may sound that name some might sound familiar to some of you because later on in life chuck colson became a, a christian and he's wrote a ton of books uh he also wrote books about the watergate cover-up and everything and uh here's what he has to say i'm going to quote it for you word for word this is what he had to say about watergate and how watergate convinced him that jesus did in fact rise from the dead here's what he said he says there were only eight or ten of us in the inner circle around the president who really knew what was going on all we had to do was stonewall for a couple of months and the watergate scandal would be over and done with we had all the power and all the prestige of the presidency at our fingertips and if the truth broke there would be embarrassment perhaps a prison sentence but there's no grave danger that our lives would ever be threatened. But we could not hold the conspiracy together for more than a couple of weeks. We could not contain the lie. Once prosecution was possible, the natural instincts of all of us were self-preservation. And it was so overwhelming that the conspirators, one by one, caved in and deserted their leaders. They stood in line at the prosecutor's office to escape going to prison. I realized that the disciples could not perpetrate a lie like the resurrection of Jesus because it is not possible. It was not just their reputations that were at stake. It was their very lives. They had no clout. They were not in the government. They had nothing to gain by lying, yet everything to lose if they did. Yet, they stood fast to the conviction that Jesus Christ is alive. Take it from somebody who knows firsthand how vulnerable a cover-up is. Nothing less than something as awesome as the resurrected Christ could have caused those men to maintain until their dying whispers that Jesus is alive and he is Lord. And like Jaden said, every one of them went to their death. Some of them horrible deaths, maintaining that Jesus was alive. I mean... When you really consider the evidence, the church has survived some 2,000 plus years. The calendar that everybody uses, whether they're a follower of Jesus or not, revolves around his death and his resurrection. There were over 500 people documented in scripture who were eyewitnesses to him being alive after that resurrection Sunday. And the inability of anybody in the first century to produce anything that even resembled his body was absent. Totally absent. Matthew chapter 28 verse 8 says, this is from the children's Bible. It says, the women left the tomb quickly. They were afraid, but they were also very, very happy. They ran to tell Jesus' followers what had happened. So, the empty tomb means that Jesus is alive. The second thing that the empty tomb means is this. It means forgiveness. It means forgiveness. When I was thinking about forgiveness, if anyone back then needed to be forgiven, if anyone needed to know that Jesus was the real deal, if anyone needed to know that he was who he said he was and he did what he said he was going to do. It was this guy who was like totally distraught by Sunday morning. It was this guy who had been with Jesus but had lied about Jesus. It was this guy who said, I'll kill people to try to hurt you but denied him. Not once, not twice, but three times in a 12-hour period. It was this distraught, guilt-ridden guy named Peter. If anybody needed forgiveness, it was, it was Peter. 
And in Luke's account of the resurrection, it says that the women ran to the disciples. And I think it's so cool. It says when Peter heard, he left them and ran to the tomb. He and John, they ran to the tomb. I mean, can you imagine the thoughts that was going through his head? Oh, I'd have been freaking out. I'd have been freaking out because, because you know, it was just, just, um, let's see, early Friday morning, late Thursday night, and I'm going, I don't know the dude, and I turn around, and there's Jesus walking by staring at me. I would have been freaking out, right? But, and I guarantee you, he's thinking, I'm the last person he wants to see. He doesn't want nothing to do with me. He called me the rock, and that was a joke. Ain't no way he wants to see me. Man, why am I so happy then? Why am I running to the, why am I so happy? I lied. I lied about Jesus. I denied him to everybody. I acted big and bad, and I'm the biggest wimp there ever was. I ran away. Why am I so happy? I mean, I can imagine that's what's going through his mind. The Bible tells us that he was the very first person to see Jesus alive. I think I'd have passed on that. I think I'd have been too scared to see Jesus alive, you know. But I think that's kind of cool, too. First Corinthians chapter 15. Look what it says. This is Paul talking again. He said, I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture said. He was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. Peter was first. The Bible doesn't give us any details about that meeting. Boy, I'd have loved to have been a fly on the wall. I, and can you imagine how it went? Man, I can just see it now. I mean, Jesus just smiling at Peter. And Peter's stumbling. He can't get his words right. He can't put a sentence together right. He's crying. There's snot going everywhere. It, it's, I'd have loved to have been a fly on the wall. Regardless, I know what Jesus did. You know what he did? He forgave Peter. He forgave Peter. And I can stand here confidently and tell you that because it's the same Peter who became a major leader in the early church. You know, this same guy who was so scared that he lied, he knew Jesus. Later, after being filled with the Holy Spirit, he stood up in a crowd of people, some of the very same people who yelled crucify him, some of the very same people that may have even participated in the crucifixion, and he preached Jesus boldly to them. Look at Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 39. Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you, to your children, and to those far away, all who have been called by the Lord our God. This is part of that, that, that sermon that he preached. Peter understood something better than anybody else did. He understood that the empty tomb means forgiveness. He experienced it, and then he was able to share it with anybody that would listen to him. Let me ask you something. Any of y'all need forgiveness? I would venture to say everybody in here does, and me probably more than any of you. We all need forgiveness. We all do. How can we get it? Peter told us right there in those verses, we just need to come to the place where we humbly repent of our sins, ask Jesus into our lives, be baptized. I know that a lot of you sitting here this morning, a lot of you that are watching online, you've done that. At some point in your life, somewhere, somehow, you got on your knees and you said, God, I need you. You, you said, I'm lost without you. You said, I've done horrible things. You said, I want you. And you ask him to come into your life. But I also know that anytime there's a crowd like this or a crowd likes watching online, there are people, for whatever reason, who haven't done that. All I got to say to you is this. The God of heaven and earth 
wants more than anything else to have a relationship with you. Which I think is pretty awesome. I mean, we're talking about the God who created stuff. All the stuff here. He created it all. There's not one thing he, that we have that he didn't create. Yet that same God, that same all-powerful, almighty God wants a relationship with us. I don't know why. I know me. But he does. He does. I told you that John ran with Peter to the tomb. Peter beat him there. I don't know if he tripped him, you know, <laughs> threw rocks at him. I don't know what it, how he beat him, but he beat him there, okay? But John went to that tomb with Peter. And they both looked in and saw that it was empty. John understood that the empty tomb means forgiveness also. In fact, he wrote about that later in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. He says, but if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unwicked or all wickedness. The empty tomb means Jesus is alive. And the empty tomb means that God's grace is greater than our sin. That brings me to the third and final point. Yes, see, you're going to get out before dinner. Um, maybe. Um, the empty tomb also means that you and I can have new life. It means we can have new life. Jesus went to the cross to give me and you and every person on this planet a new life. And the resurrection means that we can have it. The question becomes, what, what is this new life? And why is it new? And, and what's it all about? Well, I go back to something I was saying earlier. The reason God had to devise this plan of reconciliation before creation is because the fact that, that God is, is omnipresent, which means he's in the past, he's in the present, he's in the future. He knows. He knew before he created anything that the, that the masterpiece of his creation, you and me, would sin and set up a horrible gap between us and him. He knew that. And so he devised this plan of reconciliation where somebody had to pay for the sin. Somebody had to, you know, do the time, so to speak. And he knew it had to be himself. The second person of the Godhead, Jesus, who was fully man and fully God. And so Jesus' death on, on that cross, his shedding of blood, washed our sin, cleansed our sin, gave us his righteousness. But without the resurrection, it wouldn't have mattered at all. It would not have mattered. But because of sin, you and I are born with a sin nature. I say this all the time. You don't have to teach a baby how to be bad. Am I right? They don't care it's 3 o'clock in the morning. They don't care you worked a 12-hour shift before you came home. If their diaper's wet, they want your butt changing it. And they will whine and cry and scream and kick and shout until you do. Nobody, I know, I can say this with confidence, ain't nobody ever taught a baby how to be bad. But all of us who are moms and dads spend a lifetime trying to teach them how to be good. We're all born with sin. It's a sin nature. But that sin also says we're doomed for death. If it hadn't have been for Jesus, we would have all had no hope. John 3, 16, everybody knows from heart, if, even if you've never been to church before. But when you add it to John 3, 17, it kind of changes things a little bit. John 3, 16 and 17 says, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. That's new life. That is new life right there. A life that we get to spend eternity with the God who created us. And I think that's pretty cool. But, you know, I, I think about it and I see a lot of Christians walking around in a fog. I see a lot of Christians walking around with uh, less than joy on their face. And I just can't help but wonder, have they really grasped 
this whole thing? Have they really grasped the extreme benefits of having Jesus in your life? Have they really grasped the whole idea of the God of heaven and earth wanting to spend eternity with you? Because I think if they had, they wouldn't walk around that way. I got to tell you, some of the folks that, that say they're believers, I see them walking around. I don't want what they got. I don't. We're born again under God's grace. And because of that, there's hope. And because of that, that's amazing. That is amazing. First Peter chapter 1, verse 3 says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his, it is by His great mercy that we've been born again. Because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation. Wow. Here's what I know. New life has hope. New life has hope. New life also changes us. You see, when, when, when the Holy Spirit comes into our life, when Jesus comes into our lives, our perspective on just about everything shifts. It, it, it shifts because of this new life. We see people differently than we saw them before. Now, I got to stop here and say, even though we see them different, some of them are still dumber than dirt. Okay? And, that, and when we think that, we got to pray, God, help me change that. Because right now, they, they don't look that sharp. But we do see people differently. We also get new priorities. Everything just changes. First Colossians chapter 3 verse 10 says, you, you have begun to live the new life in which you are being made new and are becoming like the one who made you. This new life brings you the true knowledge of God. This new life sounds good, doesn't it? Doesn't it? I mean, who in their right mind wouldn't want to experience that? And quite honestly, whether they're in church, out of church, have no clue about church, that ain't, that ain't, that, that, that ain't matter. Who in their right mind, when given the opportunity to spend eternity with the God that created you versus spending the eternity apart from the God that created you. Don't even talk about hell for a second. Let's just say apart from the God who created you. Who in their right mind would choose me? Why, you know? The empty tomb means a lot. It means that Jesus is alive. It means that those of us who have said, I need you, God. And we put our stake in the ground in the right place. It also means that there's forgiveness and we all need it. We all need it. And it means that there's new life. Now, some of you... I'm sure got here this morning, and you're kind of like the two women going to the tomb that morning, you're just kind of going through the motions. You got up and came. Maybe because somebody forced you to come. Maybe because you made one of them dumb decisions at work this week and agreed to come with the guy that won't stop talking about Jesus at work. And you knew if you didn't come, you'd never hear the end of it. For whatever reason. Maybe you're one of those people that's just going through life, punching a clock every day. No passion. Just doing it. That's not hope. If it is, I don't want no parts of that hope. What you need to hear me say is the tomb was empty on that first resurrection Sunday morning. The tomb is still empty today. Jesus is not there. He is alive. And everything he said is true. I'm going to tell you something that you might not have heard before. If you go through the Bible and you get a piece of paper and a pen and you start counting every prophecy in the Old Testament made about Jesus, there's a ton of them. There's what we call minor prophecies and major prophecies. There's 360 major prophecies. 
Most of them written at least 500 years before Jesus was born in Bethlehem. I have been told that the odds of any one human being on this planet of just fulfilling eight of those 360 is so astronomical, we don't know what that number is called. It's one to ten to the 16th power. Jesus fulfilled 359 of those 360 prophecies. The one he hasn't fulfilled is his coming again. And here's the deal, you know. I'm not that smart. But if the dude did 359, you can take it to the bank. 360 is coming. The question is going to be, are you ready for that? Because when he comes again and you haven't chosen him, I got nothing else to say except you're screwed. You will spend eternity apart from the God that created you. I'm not trying to scare you. I don't want to scare you. But I want you to know that the Jesus I serve, the Jesus that I love, is the real deal. We all got to believe in something. Just like we all got to worship something. Why not believe in the real deal? Why not believe in Jesus of Nazareth? God said that he loved the world so much that he gave his only son that no one would perish if you believe in him. The empty tomb for a lot of people means a second chance. A second chance at forgiveness. A second chance at hope. A second chance at the promise of a new life. You don't have to jump through hoops. You don't have to face a certain way and pray a certain number of times a day. All you got to do is be real and say, God, I need you. I'm lost without you. I'm, I'm a horrible person. But I'm going to muster all the faith I have right now and say, I believe you died for me. And I want a relationship with you. It's all you got to do. It's all you got to do. And when you do that, I've got it on good authority that you become a child of the king. And that your eternity is sealed. You get to spend it with Jesus. And that beats everything else. Hands down. So here we are. It's Easter. It's Resurrection Sunday. If you made the choice, great. If you haven't, what are you waiting for? Just a thought. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for Resurrection Sunday. Thank you for your plan of reconciliation. Thank you for loving us that much. I can't even wrap my brain around that kind of love. Because everything in me that sa it says that my children aren't worth anybody. I'm not going to let my kids die for anybody. But you freely allowed Jesus to die for me. Thank you. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for the cross. But more importantly, Father, thank you for the empty tomb. Because that's where supernatural power is found. In Jesus' name, amen.